Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Harvard Law School Library Book Talks. I'm delighted to see you all. My name is Jocelyn Kennedy. I'm the executive director of the Law School Library. Before we begin, I want to thank the Dean's Office for sponsoring this lunch, so keep eating. Um, if you need more food, it looks like there's more lunches, so help yourself. Um, and I also want to let you know that today's talk is being recorded. It'll appear on the Law School YouTube channel in about two weeks, so you're on notice that if you're asking questions, we'll be recording your questions as well. Um, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce the author of today's book, Mastering Money, How to Beat Debt, Build Wealth, and Be Prepared for Any Financial Crisis. Norm Champ is a lecturer here at HLS teaching investment management law. He's a senior partner in the investment funds group at Kirkland and Ellis, where he heads up the regulatory solutions practice in the investment funds group. Mr. Champ is the former director of the Division of Investment Management at the SEC. While at the SEC, he led efforts to monitor the investment management industry to understand the risks that regulations should address and worked on crisis management efforts at security for firms to protect customers of those firms. He was the executive vice president and general counsel of Chilton Investment Company, worked at Davis, Polk, and Wardwell, and clerked at the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York. Money, investing, and financial stability is something that I think about all the time, so this book has been a great read for me. It offers a lot of insight and ideas on how to move towards mm. financial security. And I'm delighted to let you know that Mr. Champ is um, offering all of you a free copy of today's book. Um, so stop by the coop table on your way out, give them your name, and they'll make sure to get you a copy when it comes in. So thank you very much for that sure. generosity. And without further ado, Norm Champ. <clears throat> Great. Thanks, everyone. Great to be here. I'm going to. I, it's okay if I stand down here. I, this all feels very imposing uh, here. So great to see everyone. Thanks so much for coming out. I know that uh, it's a kind of a narrow window for people between classes and everything else. So we're going to end precisely at one, if not slightly before. Um, but that being said, would be happy to take questions all along the way. I want to make sure that I'm addressing what the audience is interested in. And so feel free to raise your hand at any point and throw anything out. I think in the limited time, I probably won't call on people, which is what I do in my law school class, but I will dispense for that with that for now, as long as we get some questions. So thanks again for coming out. I did just publish a book called Mastering Money, um, and thanks for that kind introduction about the book. Um, I want to talk to you basically about a little bit of kind of my background and how I came to do the book, then run through sort of the three basic ideas in the book, the three parts of it. Uh, and again, happy to take questions along the way. Sometimes people want to talk about SEC days and financial crisis and sort of the you know, post going to the SEC after the financial crisis. So also happy to hit those topics if, uh, if people are interested. So um, without further ado, let me just do a little bio. So uh, as was mentioned, I'm in the investment funds group at Kirkland and Ellis, where I work on regulatory issues for private investment funds. And my class here at Harvard Law School is on investment management law, private fund investment management law. Just taught it in the fall of 2019, turned my grades in January 20, 20th or whatever it was, or 18th. It's always a bit of a struggle to get the grades in, uh, but I, I got them done. I was only one day late on getting my grades in, so not too bad. Um, before writing this book, I wrote a book called Going Public that was about what it was like to go from private industry, the, in, in that case, asset management industry, into the government um, in sort of the Alice in Wonderland feel that, it, that it's when you go from private sector into the government. Uh, and that came out in 2017. As was mentioned before that, I spent five years at the US Securities and Exchange Commission. I was part of a bunch of people that were brought in after the crisis to try to reorganize the agency and reform it in light of the failure of the SEC to detect the Bernie Madoff fraud and the Allen Stanford fraud and a lot of others. And so <clears throat> spent a lot of time at the SEC trying to reform the exam program and get in place policies and procedures that would help them, help the examiners better detect fraud. And hopefully we don't have an, inst you know, an incident like that again where 
uh, those kind of frauds are missed. Before that, I was in the investment management business. And then, as was mentioned, uh, Davis Polk and clerked in the Southern District of New York. For the law students in the room, anyone, usually I get a lot of questions from law students about jobs, careers, choices. So I'll just pause there for a second if any of the law students have questions about career stuff. Um, all right, not, apparently not, that's all right. Uh, so let's go on, we'll talk a little bit about the book. And, uh oh, there we go. Uh, so there's the book cover, uh, it's available online, but you guys are all gonna get one. Um, and if you go to my website, normchamp.com, you can see material about the current book and different speeches and talks I'm doing, and then also material about uh, the prior book going public. You can also contact me through normchamp.com and I'll get emails that come from there. And that's important because at the end of this talk, I'm gonna mention that you know, so much of what I'm trying to do with this book is get the messages about financial literacy and personal finance out to people. And so if you know of any group, you know, a church group, community group, what have you, um, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, I don't know, any, you know, if there's a group that you think might enjoy a talk about some of these principles or convey the knowledge, I'd be happy to come out and do uh, a talk on it as well. So if you have an idea like that, feel free to shoot me an email through the website. Um, okay, so <clears throat> why, why write a book about personal finance in America? Uh, partly because, of course, we don't teach any aspect of financial literacy in the schools. Now, does anyone remember how we used to teach a little bit of financial literacy in the schools? Well, this would be from maybe some of the older, wait, I thought I heard it. Home, home economics, right? So, so we did at one time have home economics in schools, still do have in some places, but mostly been eliminated. But, you know, that was about making a budget, how are we going to live, you know, provide for families, et cetera. Um, but in general, we've abandoned the topic. Um, we don't really have it at the college level or the law school level. <clears throat> and at the same time, we have moved in the United States from a pension-based retirement system to a defined contribution retirement system, which I can guess almost every single person in this room participates in, where we make contributions to 401k, 403b, IRAs, Roth IRAs are traditional. So we moved from a system where most people in the US had some kind of pension coverage, usually from a private um, pension uh, plan for businesses. We moved to where we're responsible for our own retirement. Unfortunately, we didn't couple that move with any kind of uptick in financial literacy education or personal finance. Uh, and so we've left people kind of in charge of their own destinies uh, without a lot of tools on how to accomplish that goal of retirement. So if you look at the stats, they are roundly depressing. Um, you know, a good chunk of people in America say they don't have $400 for a car repair. Uh, we've got <clears throat> significant bands of people at younger ages, but even moving to older ages who have not saved anything for retirement. Um, and at the same time, we are encouraging consumers to not only are they not saving, but we are encouraging them to pile on debt. So as you can tell from that chart, we continue to set the record for consumer debt. We're, we're really good at that. Um, we had, <laughs> after the 08, the crisis in the fall of 08, we had a little bit of a blip there where personal debt went down, um, but unfortunately it's right back up and has shot past pre-crisis levels and gone to all-time record levels. Um, and so that debt is another part of the story here that people are in increasingly in debt to fund their lifestyle uh, and thus not saving for retirement and being unable to afford unexpected expenses like a car repair or a health crisis or something like that. So um, the problem is pretty well outlined. Um, the stats support it. Uh, and what I was trying to do in this book is bring together a bunch of very practical, frankly, fairly simple um, you know, concepts around personal finance. Unfortunately, I, as I talk about in the book, these principles have become sort of the lost secrets of uh, our society. They used to be quite commonplace, uh, but we don't really talk about them anymore. <clears throat> what we mostly talk about now is spending, and I'll talk about 
our consumer society in a second. But just one concrete example of this shift in our country. 50 years ago, so a scant two generations, you could go to the United States Post Office. And when you went into the United States Post Office, you could bring in your United States Post Office passbook savings account book, and you could save at the post office. And the post office would pay you interest on that savings, and you would have a, and for the younger folks in this room, you're not gonna believe this, but you had a savings book, and it literally it stuck in a machine, and it like printed on the book what you had in your account. This was just, we had just gotten out of the stone knives and bearskins uh, area, and we were into where we actually had a printed savings book. For everyone who's got their phone here where you can have a savings account on your phone, I'm, I'm sure this just sounds ridiculous, I and mean, it kind of was. But, but the main point is, 50 years ago, the government made available to us a method for savings. It was a method that people could use because people went to the post office a lot more than they do now. Uh, and basically a message from the government to save. Now, what message is the government giving us now about finance? What does the government want us to do? Spend, right? So we are relentlessly assaulted with incentives to spend from the government on down, obviously from the private side as well, and I talk a lot in the book about the various techniques that are used to get us to spend and buy, and how those are designed to stimulate our endorphins and get us to spend more. Um, so we're under relentless assault to spend. Uh, and the government is no longer giving us that message to save. Now, that's fine. Uh, that's where we are. I'm not naive enough to think we're going to reverse the consumer society. However, it is incumbent on each of us to take control of our own financial destiny and resist some of these messages. Now, again, not naive enough to think we're not going to consume. but. It's not in each of our interest to spend a lot and pile up a lot of debt, right? So what I'm really trying to get across in the book is helping people become what we call net worth warriors in the book. So trying to get spending down, get income up, get to a place of positive net worth, so assets exceeding liabilities, and then start investing wisely uh, to build that nest egg and keep carrying it forward. Um, <clears throat> and <clears throat> As the subtitle of the book says, having been in the government after the crisis, seeing the kind of devastation that the crisis wrought, a way for each of us as individuals to make sure that if we, we are going to have another recession. So we just finished a decade without a recession, first time ever in US history. Um, we will have another one. We have not repealed the business cycle. Uh, and when we do, um, if each of us has our own finances in order, we're gonna be much better positioned to survive that crisis and to make sure that we get through it and our families get through it okay. So uh, I have very little confidence in the government getting, you know, avoiding another crisis for us. That has not been generally the pattern in human history. Uh, and so wanna make sure that we all think about how we can build our own balance sheet and get through that next crisis. So I'm going to, unless I, any questions on the problem before we get to some of the Ideas on the other side? All right, so you're tempting me to call on people if I don't get, you know, someone has to step forward. All right, not this time, but if, if we don't get any questions, I'll have to call on people. Um, okay, so <clears throat> what are the three parts of the book? Three parts of the book are some ideas in part one about how to get control of spending and get spending down. Part two, how can we get income in, right, so we can start to have more income to offset expenses. Uh, and then the third part of the book is, how can we invest wisely with hopefully our net worth at that point? And that's particularly informed by some really, you know, going to the SEC and seeing the amount of just common everyday fraud that the SEC prosecutes and seeing how people are lured into those fraud schemes. Uh, and it's, it's pretty tragic, frankly. Uh, and so I wanna talk a little bit about how to invest without getting yourself exposed to those schemes. So, in getting control of spending, can't, you know, <clears throat> can't get into every single thing in the book. So I use the example of the phone apps, right? So these people are saying they don't have $400 for a car repair. I can guarantee you that they have a cell phone that costs them more than 100 bucks a month, and I can guarantee you that they have somewhere near the national average of nine apps that are recurring charges on their credit card bills, 
And of those nine, most people use about half of the ones that they're getting charged for. Why is that? We all know you go on an app, you get the free trial, and then you can cancel later. Canceling later, either we forget to do or it turns out to be a lot harder to uh, do than, than is possible. I don't, don't mean to cast, cast aspersions on them, but the gym right up here on Mass Ave, actually I used as an example, the one, now I'm forgetting the name, they're the one where one, you know, to cancel their gym membership, you have to send them a certified letter right, to tell them that you want to cancel. Right? One, once you're in, you're in. You can't get out. Uh, so, so we are... We've got all these recurring expenses coming at us, all these ways that we, are got, that we get into these habit of having these things charged to our credit cards. Most people, there, I also, now, I was a little hesitant on this because I talk in the book about there are some apps that will then analyze your statements and tell you which apps you're not using and which ones you get rid of. I'm sort of thinking, all right, well, you know, we get the apps battling or whatever. But anyway, so there are apps you can actually use to look at that and see whether you can, there are apps you can get rid of and see what they're costing you. Um, I was doing a talk last night, actually at the Harvard Club in New York, by chance, um, and someone in the audience, I was saying earlier, right, I, it's been great just talking to people about this because I feel like I learn so much. Uh, and they pointed out the, the, another great one, the cable bill, right, and we all have the cable bill basically to get internet now. But if you have the NBA pass, the Major League Baseball pass, right, all these things that they're trying to sell you that keep charging you every year and put your uh, cable bill up high, again, things that you're not thinking about that are chipping away at your spending side. Um, so do lots of tips in the book. Um, use the apps one as an example, but there's a million, there's tons of resources on the web to think about how to get spending down. Um, Again, we are in a consumer society, it's not gonna stop, but there are lots of tricks to think about, do we really need that next thing? You know, I'm sure you've heard many of them, right? When you see something you wanna buy, just tell yourself you'll wait 24 hours, right? See if we really, really want it 24 hours later. Um, try to get the number of credit cards down, so we're, everywhere we go, they'll give you a free credit card. I mean, I, I, flying up here on American, I guess they didn't do it because it's such a short flight, but you know, usually the flight attendants are coming down the aisle trying to give you the American Airlines credit card application, go into a store, they'll give you a store card, right? So trying to cut down on all that, maybe get to one that you pay off all the time to build your credit rating um, and try to stay away from multiple. If you really can't do that, you know, then some people are switching, leaving the credit cards at home, just going to cash. All the studies show that if you have cash in your pocket and you start spending that, you spend less because it's a lot more real when you, you know, hand, hand cash over. So lots of ideas on that side. Um, on, so we sort of talked about the perils of a consumer society and, and debt. Um, what's the most pernicious kind of debt coming out of our consumer society? There are different kinds of debt, right? So what's the absolute worst one? Loan credit, card. credit cards. So student loans aren't so great either, but credit cards are usually like double or triple the rate on your student loans. Um, so credit cards are the worst by far. Uh, you know, you can easily end up, if you get, fall behind, easily end up paying in the 20s in the percentage rate. Um, at a time when the Fed is loaning interest, you know, loaning money to the banks at under 1%, right? So credit cards are the worst. We're given lots of opportunities to use them. Uh, we use them so much that credit card companies can handle the defaults that we're going to inevitably have. Uh, and we're going to, if you get into the business of paying credit cards and carrying balances, you're going to pay interest rate that's just out of control. So credit cards are the worst single one. However, I have an entire chapter on another kind of debt, which is housing debt. So that chapter is called The Housing Trap. Um, and our government relentlessly tries to get us to buy homes and apartments. I live in New York City, so it's buying apartments, but up here it would be homes or condos. But right, US government is trying to get all of us to buy houses. Now, this derives from a belief often expressed on Capitol Hill in Washington that a home is a path to wealth. Well. Maybe, um, but what I argue in the book is that a house is an investment as well. It's an investment decision just like any other. We've wrapped it in a bunch of, you know, sort of this is a way to build your wealth and plan for retirement and grow your wealth. Um, those things just aren't true, right? They might be, right, but they're not necessarily true. Uh, very important to analyze whether if you're going to buy a house or an apartment to really go through the analysis of whether it's the right thing to do for you. Um, 
How does the US government do this to us? Um, well, in the last decade, of course, they have done so by keeping interest rates at lowest rates in our history. People are always asking me what's gonna cause the next recession. If I knew that, I probably wouldn't be a you know, working lawyer you know, trying to get, if I knew when the next one was coming and how, I'd just short all the right things and that would be, I'd be done. Um, but if you think about the low interest rates that we have had for a decade, I'm pretty sure that whatever the next crisis is tipped off by, the fact that we've piled on all this debt with lo these low interest rates is gonna, there's something, it's somehow gonna be related to that. I'm not sure how. Um, so we've had relentlessly low interest rates for over a decade. We have a mortgage interest deduction for uh, people to further entice them to take out a mortgage. Um, anyone know how many people actually itemize deductions in this country and could use that mortgage deduction? Okay. There you go. There, there's that, and actually the vast majority of people in the United States take the standard deduction because it actually works out to be better. So you have to make sure. Good. Yeah. <clears throat> yes. That's right, and we've both. Yep. <clears throat> Correct, and the overall limit on mortgages, you know, the deductibility of mortgages came down. Um, so we've had some changes for sure vast majority of people are taking the standard deduction. So if you're analyzing buying a house and you know the brokers are all, I remember, because like I was an idiot when I bought my first apartment in New York and had no idea what I was doing. Um, you know, and the broker's saying, oh, it's deductible. Well, make sure that it is in fact deductible and that it is something that is beneficial to you. And of course, the government then, to just lard on top, icing on top of more cake, um, it guarantees mortgages uh, in the United States through the GSEs, the two government-sponsored entities. Um, giving us 30-year mortgages. Anyone know how many other countries have 30-year mortgages? Zero. Um, so uh, when you think of the incentives that are driving us to buy housing, again, you have to think about it in terms of your own, right? The government wants that for you. It might or might not be a good idea. Again, often it works out well. Uh, the folks that got foreclosed on in 2009 and 2010 after the crisis, however, and had their net worths wiped out and had their credit ratings ruined, they will not tell you that housing was a path to uh, prosperity for them. In fact, by government policy and by government edict, um, prior, just as we ran up to the crisis, lots of mandated lending to underserved areas and underserved borrowers and low-income borrowers who could least afford the kind of devastation that was wrecked on their credit ratings and their credit history. So um, think about a house just like anything else. Think about whether you're gonna move. Um, our relentless promotion of housing causes less mobility in the workforce. We are in an unprecedented jobs boom right now, lowest unemployment in, you know, beyond memory. Um, and yet we are seeing less geographic movement for jobs uh, than we would expect. And that's a lot of part of that reason, a part of that reason is mortgage debt and people not being able to move. So think about whether you're gonna need mobility, think about whether you're gonna stay where you wanna buy sort of five years, I think is a good benchmark. Think about whether you can actually put down a significant down payment uh, so that you're not, you know, if we do have a downturn that you're not immediately underwater. One of the <clears throat> saddest public policy decisions I have seen in my career is that in 2011, 10, so two and a half, three years after the crisis, uh, the Obama administration you know, had moved up the minimum down payment on a mortgage, like 20%, and wiping our memories, as we always do, they went right back down to 3% minimum uh, for down payments. Uh, again, two and a half, three years after the crisis, so we're back down to certain mortgages having a 3% down payment. If you make a 3% down payment and borrow 97% on that house, your margin for staying out from underwater in that mortgage is, is razor thin, and all we need is a mild recession, and you'll probably be underwater on your house. So again, part of my main message, make these decisions based on what's best for you, not what's best for the national economy, not for what the government wants from you, but think about it in your own terms and think about uh, what it means for you. Um, okay, last one. We're, so I wanna, I wanna make sure you stay up. Actually, I'll, I'll just pause there before hitting the hidden taxes. 
All right, don't, any, don't make me call on any of my former students here. Anyone from the fall? Uh, no, all right. Yes, question in front. Yes, ma'am. Just, to, just, just imagine. <laughs> yep, yep. Um, so great question. Um, you know, I, I know. So just question. You know, what do we do when we have spouses, partners, etc., who have different ideas about spending? Now, again, none of us have ever encountered that at all. Uh, and so, um, so great question. So, have devote about half a chapter to sort of thinking about. Um, Spouses, uh, partners, thinking about how to manage those right, those tensions. There are, there is no, and you know, I think I'm a decent investment management lawyer, not much of a marriage counselor, right? So I'm, um, I, I've tried, I tried to be restrained in the section, but I think important to think about it up front. Important to find the model that works best. So I think there are multiple different rights. So obviously we've got. <laughs> people who just maintain completely separate financial lives, and then we've got people who absolutely pool everything, right? Um, I sort of come down in the middle somewhere because I do, you're all, I mean, does anyone see eye to eye on you know, spending, right? Um, and so I kind of like the middle model maybe where <clears throat> pooling most um, income and, and assets and so forth, but <clears throat> leaving some room for each party to, maybe have an account that the other person is not seeing or monitoring, right? And so that there's some room for each person to do some spending that maybe they don't want to you know, account for or whatever, but hopefully try to <clears throat> cabin that into a certain amount, right? So, okay, you know, I might, <clears throat> my wife always says, you know, people spend money on different things. And I think it's really true. I might want to do it on, you know, who knows? I was going to say a Knicks game, but they're terrible. Uh, but, you know, go to a sporting event and maybe my wife wants to do something different. So maybe have some pools where you can have that. Now, obviously, you got to set the amount, and that's going to be a conversation. But I, I'm sort of, <clears throat> I feel like that middle ground may create less controversy on that, and you know, sort of have a balance, right? Because I think when you go to the completely pool everything, then there's usually going to be more tension about the extra spending, right? And so, uh, but it's a great question. So and and also um, have a lot of resources in the book. So. Um, pulls together a lot of websites and links and things, and there are many websites about kind of like, you know, how to deal with this in marriages and, and partnerships. So that's another, there's lots of resources out there. Never an easy subject, though. Um, any other, so excellent, we broke the ice. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> <clears throat> Yep. <clears throat> yep. Yep. So great question. You have some debt outstanding. <clears throat> let's say it's federal student loan debt, and it's at a fixed interest rate, and let's say it's relatively reasonable in sing single digits, like seven percent. Should you? strive just to pay that off, or should you try to put some of your assets into investments that might yield more? So <clears throat> I am certainly an anti-debt guy, as you can tell. So I come out a little more on the pay down debt side of this debate. However, it is important to look at the returns. So if you're earning some, if you're paying 7% on the student loan, <clears throat> long-term stock appreciation over time is 11% a year. So you can potentially make out ahead on that. Now, there's a problem with that, which is it, all the studies we did at the SEC show that you know, retail investors tend to, when stocks are going great, as they have been lately until last Friday, but they seem to have rallied, uh, when stocks are going great, so we're, people know we're you know, basically about to hit March of 2020, which will signify an 11-year bull market, uh, unprecedented. So consumer retail behavior tends to be, stocks are going great, everyone jumps in, stocks crash and go down, everyone jumps out. Um, it's almost 
word for word, buying high and selling low. The exact opposite, of course, of what you want to do. So when you're making some of those investment decisions, if you're going to lever between returns and pick between returns, make sure that you're a kind of investor that can ride it out in stocks and, and earn that 11% over time. There are some amazing stats of different years where the entire gain in a year comes from like four days, right? If you on up and down years. So you have to be able to stay in and be disciplined. So I do accept that you can, you should make that decision and look at returns. Another great example, mortgages. I mean, you can get mortgages in like the two and 3% range. So again, I'm an anti-debt guy and I support trying to have a regular pay down at that principle. On the other hand, if you have bonds that are yielding seven or eight percent, you may not want to devote every dollar to that. And then these things change too. As you get closer to retirement, you have to think through if are you going to sell assets where you have to pay tax to pay off some other debt, or maybe you're just going to leave your house and downsize, right? So you don't necessarily have to take that tax hit. So you have to factor in the tax piece as well. So it's a great question. How do you, and one that's very highly individualized. Um, but I do err more towards paying down debt. I'm, I'm an anti-debt guy because, you know, Ben Frank, I quote Franklin, you know, the value of assets goes up and down, debt stays the same, right? So if, you know, if your house is fluctuating, you still have to pay the amount of the mortgage. Um, anyone else? Okay. Um, all right. So <clears throat> I want to, again, be timely, stay on track. So the last one on the kind of watch the outgo section is the hidden taxes in our society. So sales tax, um, we all unfortunately have to pay sales tax, very regressive tax, right? So it hits everyone equally, which is the definition of regressive tax. Um, so you have to watch out for those kinds of things. I list a bunch of other taxes. Now, I'm only gonna touch briefly on the hidden tax that is my absolute pet peeve and hobby horse. I could talk about it for the next 30 minutes, but I'm not going to. Um, so the most unjust and difficult and terrible public policy hidden tax in our society is the lottery. So um, you know, a sales tax, at least you're buying, you have to buy something and you have to pay a tax on it. It's a regressive tax, but we have government relentlessly promoting the lottery. Um, the chance of winning the lottery being equivalent to my chance of being struck by lightning right now. Um, and the, you know, with the constant, and I talk about it a lot in the book, and I talked about it in the prior book, again, it's my hobby horse, um, but the lottery constantly, oh, we're going to spend on education, et cetera. All the studies show it's simply another part of the budget, right? And we have relentless advertising similar to the way the government promotes housing. Government relentlessly advertises the lottery. In, if you look at the economic research on the lottery, it is, of course, a regressive tax. It's the worst kind of regressive tax because it's promoted by the government. And in New York, where I live, low-income New Yorkers spend about 10% of their income on lottery tickets. Uh, and that is dollars that come from housing, food, and clothing, and everything for families. In fact, the net proceeds of the lottery are about equal to our entire transfer payments in the United States. So all of our welfare and transfer payments roughly add up to the lottery. Why don't we get rid of the one? And I bet we would have to pay less of the other. Um, so I deeply, you know, a, a, a deep policy issue that we don't have to cover extensively here, but one that I'm trying to, to maybe do something about the outcome of. I formed a 501c4 to advocate for some of these personal financial literacy points, and one of which is I think we should get the government out of the business of advertising a terrible investment. Um, how about if we had, back to the post office, what if we had positive messages about savings instead of, here, give me your money for the lottery, right? What if we went the other way and maybe we move the lottery sales to the back of the store like we did with cigarettes, remember that? Uh, maybe we don't advertise them anymore, and then maybe we tell people the financial truths that they need to know. Um, that would, you know, that would warm my heart. One last sort of anecdote on that, right? So the Ad Council and the American Association of CPAs have done some public service announcements on financial literacy, and they started showing up on the sides of bus stops in New York. And I thought, well, okay, that's interesting, since again, I'm really into this stuff. So they're going to put signs on the side of bus stops. The first series is 
on the side of a bus stop, be the rich, eccentric uncle you wish you had. <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, there's subtle, and then there's incomprehensible, right? Um, maybe we could put on that max your 401k, something. <laughs> don't buy a house you can't afford. Don't play the lottery. I mean, you know, there's some simple messages that we could have gotten out there. The rich, eccentric uncle, I still wasn't, I'm still not even sure what that means. Uh, so it'd be great if maybe we could change some of the messages that we're giving, like away from the lottery. I go, I have a whole chapter on the lottery, so you can uh, enjoy it at your leisure, but it's big business, right? Private companies bid to the states um, to raise the money. That's why you see all the advertising you do, all the new games, right? All this stuff. It all follows a pattern. People play a lot in the beginning, then it starts to fade. Then they start introducing all the different new games, right? So that they can get, they can impose the regressive tax even harder. Uh, so anyway, all right, that's it on the lottery. Um, okay, so, well, I'll pause there. Outgo, any other questions on outgo? And then we'll talk a little bit about ingo. Um, okay, on the ingo side, uh, very, <clears throat> pretty simple. Um, nothing like a job, um, which I, you know, suspect most people in this room know, nothing like a job to get us out into the workforce, build our skills, help us network, help us get to the next level and to advance in our careers. Um, it also, most jobs, not all, but many, come with a tremendous, tremendous benefit. I was talking to several people about it before uh, the talk, um, which is a tax deferred savings program. Uh, 401k for those in the public sector, 403b, um, but essentially a way to save pre-tax dollars into an account and defer the tax on the earnings, and if you're on the younger side in this audience, defer the tax on the earnings literally for decades. During those decades in which you enjoy tax-free growth on your investments uh, all the way through. And so when we get back to the 11% return on something like stocks, you know, if you have stocks in there, and you're not selling them, and even if you do sell them, you still don't pay tax. Um, the 401k is, and the related IRAs, so traditional IRA and Roth IRA, we talk a little bit about the differences of those, but the number one gift, the tax code doesn't give us a whole lot of gifts, imposes a lot of pain, this is the one gift. Uh, and along with 529s to save for college for kids, these are tremendous, tremendous vehicles, and I say to my law students every time my fall class, okay, we're gonna talk about investment management law and that's all great. I hope you really come into our field and everything. But if you leave this class with one message, please maximize your 401k contribution and in particular, take advantage of any employer match. Uh, so we all the stats show that we're having not record participation in, in 401ks. Uh, people start when they start working and of course, it feels like a lot, of a lot of taxes and other things are being taken out of your check. A lot of people don't want to sign up for a 401k. So when we have positive election to the 401k, the participation rates hover kind of in the 50s, 60s. When you force people to participate and then opt out, it's just like the apps on the phone and everything else. They tend to stay in. So then we, if, you if you force people in and then they have to get out, the participation rate is more like 80s or 90s. We're all going to Forget all that and just max our 401ks uh, because the growth potential over time in those vehicles is out of control. Uh, and um, think about also that we are, you, you can move now, I mean, right, so you can take your 401k a lot of times, you know, people, oh, it's a retirement account, where am I going to, you can roll it out into an IRA. I've rolled out from every job I've ever been on, I've rolled out into an IRA and, you know, eventually over time it really grows. So. Tremendous benefit. Um, you can do it in the IRA format as well. Uh, last night someone asked me what's my view between traditional IRAs and Roth IRAs. I don't really care as long as you're you know, putting as much money in as you can. Roth IRAs have the disadvantage of putting the tax up front, so you are out of pocket for the tax. Traditional IRAs put the tax off a long, long time and I prefer that from a math perspective, tax deferred, and particularly when it's deferred that long, down the road can be basically a huge win, but I'm somewhat agnostic. It's more important to get IRAs uh, in place and, and use them. Now, how do we know that these accounts are hugely valuable to us and an incredible advantage? Briefly, in the Obama administration, for about two nanoseconds, they had a proposal to tax people's 529 plans, right? 
the college savings plan also tax uh, deferred and, and actually tax deductible in New York and non-taxable in the end. That proposal died again in about two seconds, right? But I always think if the government's trying to come after it, it's probably good for us. So make sure to focus on the tax deferred accounts and make sure you max them out, as in particular the employer match. Yes, ma'am. Yep. So question, how does 529 fit in? So a friend of mine once said, it's not the only solution. So I totally agree. Um, and particularly, we're in a much better place now because the options in the 529s are, have pretty much come up and are very good pretty much across all states. Originally, New York had some you know, random investment manager you never heard of. You know, I'm sure it was someone brother, someone's brother-in-law. And then that got, and now it's Vanguard, right? And so the, the options in most 529s have come up to be really good. I, so my personal thing, I don't know about Massachusetts. In New York, $10,000, the first 10,000 that you put in the 529 is tax deductible. So I always put 10,000 in a year, right? Because I get a deduction on the New York taxes and the 10,000's in there growing tax-free. But I agree with you, it's not one solution, right? You, you're, you, know, you have to go across all the different pieces of um, ways to save. And I'll talk about different kinds of accounts and matching taxability to the right accounts. Um, but I agree with you, it's not one solution. Um, and obviously, you know, the one good thing we have going there is most of the colleges have a lot of financial aid, right, that you know, can help defer some of this. Um, and so that, but you're right, believe me, as a, I've got two kids in college and two in high school, so I'm fully familiar with those numbers, uh, and they are shocking. Um, so any other? Questions on, yes, ma'am. Uh, oh, 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 required minimum distributions. Um, uh, wow. Oh, interesting. So you take it out of the IRA, it's traditional IRA, and then go to the Roth. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I, I hear you. Um, I have to say, I hadn't ever thought of that. I'm not there yet, but that sounds like a great idea, right? Because you're basically, you're going to have the tax when you take the required minimum distribution, and now you can put the post-tax dollars in the Roth. So sure. Now remember, now, so actually great bridge to, let's just talk about, I want to make sure we stay on time. Let's just talk about managing, I want to talk about maximizing the tax on the accounts, right? So this, the third point here, so make sure to maximize the power of the taxable and the non-taxable accounts, right? So I get, often we'll start talking to people and I go through in the book, so part three of the book, trying to invest wisely, right? And really, frankly, this is a, a section of the book where I really try to get people to do it themselves. Sorry for the financial, if there's any financial advisors in the room. Um, but, you know, and the reason for that is kind of what I call the tragedy of affinity fraud, and I go through a lot of affinity fraud in the book. So one of the shocks when you get to the SEC is they're bringing all these cases. Now, when you think about the SEC, maybe you see you know, a case against Goldman Sachs or something in the headlines, these big cases, right? The vast majority of what the SEC does is prosecuting basically garden variety everyday stealing from other people fraud. Um, and most of the stealing from other people fraud <laughs> revolves around affinity fraud. What do I mean by affinity fraud? There is, you know, let's say you've planned well and you are taking your required minimum distributions, trying to figure out where to put the money. There's a nice young person in your church group, community group, what have you, who says, oh, I'll take care of that and, you know, I'll go invest it. Well, unfortunately, they're usually not nice and they're usually stealing the money. Um, and it's frustrating because these are people who've worked hard and gotten to the net worth point where they have investable assets, uh, and then they're getting taken away and, and stolen. Why? I think it's fear, right? We are not taught about all this stuff. There's a lot of fear about investing, a lot of fear about um, that, you know, what do I do with money that I have to invest? And when there's sort of a trusting, trusted person and who's right there who might then be able, you know, who you feel like you can trust, 
the biggest example of affinity fraud in our history. Uh, Bernie Madoff preyed on the Jewish community. Uh, it was well known among you know, uh, Jewish uh, charity groups and, um, and was able to access that community and steal $50 billion. Um, and so w what I think is important on this is I did use to regulate mutual funds at the SEC, so I'm a little biased towards mutual funds. Mutual funds are heavily regulated by the US government. We haven't had any examples of anyone stealing any money out of mutual funds. They're very low cost. Um, they are watched closely. They're, basically, their fees have come down to ridiculously low levels. Um, and so it is a very safe way to get into investing. I go through some simple asset allocations, taking the number 125 or the number 100, subtracting your age, getting your stock and bond. Um, portfolio, getting your stock and bond allocation, and then start doing it through mutual funds again, which are basically all the minimum. Most of the big shops have raved all the minimums. The fees are low. Very safe way to invest. So finally, coming back to long answer to your question, very important as you're doing that to think about tax and your accounts. So in your tax deferred accounts, like the 401k and the IRA, important to put things in there that are tax disfavored. What's tax disfavored? Corporate bonds are tax disfavored. If you buy a corporate bond, the interest on a corporate bond is taxable at your ordinary income rates. If you put corporate bonds into your retirement accounts that are not collecting tax, you can generate tremendous compounding in those accounts tax-free uh, until you have to take your required minimum distributions. Similarly, or on the other side of the coin, um, municipal bonds are not taxed at all. So most muni bonds are tax-free. And if you get state bonds here in Massachusetts, let's say, then they're triple tax-free. Um, so you don't want to put those in your 401k or your IRA, right? Put your muni bonds in your taxable accounts because they are tax-favored so that you're going to collect that interest on those bonds tax-free in your own accounts. Um, and then stocks fall somewhere in the middle. Stocks have a favorable taxation rate, which is 23.9 um, now with the Obama medical care device tax appended to the 20% cap gains rate. Um, and so they are tax favored. They're not as tax favored as they used to be because personal income rates have come down. Um, so you can think about stocks as you're making your well, asset allocation. You can kind of put them in either one because they do have some tax favorability, but they do have tremendous compounding ability over time. So they're great in tax-free accounts as well. So I would say as you are taking your required minimum distributions, think about your overall asset allocation, which as we get older is going to be more towards bonds, and think about which bonds fit well if you're going to roll them into a Roth, right? Because you would want to do corporate bonds in your Roth. So did you, did you take out Roth Yeah, I'm, I'm not a fan of taking extra distributions. I'm Mr. Anti-Tax, so anything where we can push tax down the road, I'm, I'm always in favor of. So I would take, the, if you can afford it, I would take the minimum. And you know, I also devote probably half a chapter to Social Security. You know, it doesn't get much play anymore, but it is a retirement income stream. And I believe politically, it's never going anywhere, despite you know all the scare stories about bankruptcy and everything. I, I think it'll be there, and it's another factor that you want to. But if you can afford it, I would take the minimum distributions. Now, the only thing, all this stuff is contingent on how these plans work now and, and not having changes to them, right? And people probably saw last year, we got a change to the inherited IRA scheme, which was very disfavorable and frankly very disappointing because if we're doing all this planning, if you change the rules on us, then you know, we have to adjust. And so basically saying that an inherited IRA has to have a 10-year payout, you know, so it's essentially 10% a year of required minimum distributions. Um, and I thought that was a terrible development, right? Because that was not what people were planning on. Um, so you have to kind of constantly factor in any changes that might come. And so a lot of this, all of this is predicated on kind of where we are now. Um, okay. So I want to, I see people, it's 10 of, um, and the library folks said at 10 of, people would start going to class. So I um, want to be mindful of time. Let's just, last two slides. Um, let's just talk. So, you know, if we get there, if we get through all this, we get an outflow down, income in, we get some investing, um, then we can be a net worth warrior. The book is de dedicated to everyone who wants to be a net worth warrior. Um, Think about emergency fund, you know, as, as we kind of go through this journey, there will be ups and downs, people lose jobs, health 
you know, emergencies, that kind of thing. Make sure you have six months worth of expenses on hand. That's particularly true if you have a mortgage. Um, you know, we want to get to net worth where our assets exceed our liabilities. Kind of goes back to the question of paying down debt. Um, we want to get our assets to the point where that side of the balance sheet is ahead of our liability side, and hopefully we're paying down our liability side. But either way, we want to get to where we're in a cash positive basis on, on our assets over our liabilities. Um, I think set realistic financial goals. I feel like the lottery, to some extent, is part of this kind of, oh, you know, I want to get to here. I want to make it to this element of financial um, achievement. It's very much more important to sort of focus on shorter, hey, going to do better this month, right? That's what I try to do <laughs> is just do better now and then keep building. And the power of compounding tends to, over time, really get you to great results. But if the so you know we're buying a lottery ticket to win 350 million. You know we're swinging for the fences and we're throwing the money away. Um, and you know it kind of comes back to what I was talking about in the beginning. You have a positive net worth. You have the emergency fund. You have all these things in place. We get to our next recession, and you know unfortunately some of us will lose our jobs, and different things will happen, and stocks will go down, and everything. But if we have set ourselves up in this position, then we'll be able to go through the next crisis, right? And we won't have any kind of wipeout effect on our families or our finances. So there is an end goal. Every speech I gave at the SEC, I always had a couple of paragraphs about the fact that you know, we were there to watch out for America's investors. And we were doing that because Americans are saving for real things, right? Education of their kids, to buy a house, if that's the right decision. Um, you know, retirement, right? These are real goals that people are seeking and trying to save for. And it was really, you know, as part of our job to make sure that those savings were safe. So I'm going to maybe last thing, try to pass it on. So we, we, we basically, this has all been eliminated in schools. We don't get very much of it as we were talking about in the beginning. Um, so try to think about how to convey this. As I'll, I'll point to the last piece there, which I mentioned in the beginning. I'm available to go anywhere, do anything, you know, have, have talk will come. Um, would love to get out there and just get the message out to people, to as many people as possible. Uh, and it's really helpful, I think, at all ages. So a lot of this stuff, you have it, younger people, right, have longer timelines, so there's a little more power in it. But there's things that we can do at any stage. When you turn 50, um, you know, which I did an indeterminate number of years ago. Um, the, you know, the government gives you another present, which is a catch up on your 401k or IRA. You can add, I think it's now 6,000 extra per year uh, after 50 over what the ordinary contribution is. So that's something you can take advantage of if you need to catch up a little bit later in life. Um, and just trying to get out there and get the message and see if we can, you know, reach folks. I've been doing a ton on social media and promoting things there. And, doing lots of talks and everything. So if, if you know a community group that might be interested, I'd love to, to come and do it. And I think I will stop there at six or seven of and see if we have any last questions before we, before we go. Yes, ma'am? Yep, so we will have a nice downturn. Uh, we'll see how severe it is, as you say. So a couple things. I think to get any of the kind of recurring payments down, right, so that we can just make some small, like small increments in this world make a lot of difference. So another thing that you see people doing is just whatever you can do, just do it, you know, to your point of now, right? So if the most you can do is divert 25 bucks a month from your paycheck, to a savings account or an investing account where you're going to start investing, do it, right? I mean, you know, hopefully we don't, I mean, I will say this, the odds of a recession prior to the election are almost zero, right? Like the U US presidential election years for a fourth year of a president, of a, the fourth year of an incumbent president's term, first term is the best economic years we've ever had in America. Every, we have, yeah, we, we got a minimum of eight months. <laughs> I mean, I, look, we could get a recession before then, but. Generally, you don't in presidential election years uh, by incumbents. So they will, of course, do everything they can to keep the economy going. So I would 
just small steps. Like, so even, right, if there is an emergency fund, then let's start building it, even if it's 50 bucks a month. You know, and usually, like, go through all this, I, you know, there's tons of stuff in the book, right? There's little, the little things, um, you don't miss them, right? So if you set that up where it's 25 or 50 bucks a month going to a separate account, if you don't look at it, generally people don't miss it at all. It builds, right? And it gives a lot of psychological reinforcement, right? So once you kind of get on the right path on this stuff, then it, there's a real psychology to it that's positive. So I would take, try to slash some of the outgo, because you know once the downturn comes and you lose your job, then you start slashing outgo, it's not gonna be as effective. And then maybe some small steps to save, so. Let's see, yes sir. ETS versus mutual funds. So um, we could, of course, have an entire law school class go for 12 weeks on that. Um, but um, so essentially, so ETFs, exchange traded funds, what's the difference between ETFs and mutual funds? So ETFs, exchange traded funds, are traded mutual funds. That's all they are. Um, and they contain a piece, that are a part of them is incredibly valuable for all of you as, as investors, which is, that there is no sales load on generally on an ETF, right? So ETFs were a way to distribute funds directly to the public with that, right? So in our business, there's an old thing, most funds are sold, not bought, meaning that you get in your 401k, someone has already gotten your employer to buy the menu of funds that are on that 401k, right? Those were sold to someone. Um, and so you don't have unlimited choice in there. And it's the same with brokerage accounts and everything else. Brokers are generally selling you funds. The nice thing with ETFs is you kind of get that middle person out of the way. Um, you can buy the ETFs directly with no distribution fees. So that part of them is great. Um, they are, just like mutual funds, tremendously low cost. The big, probably, advantage is you can get out of them. If you want to get out of them at 10 o'clock this morning, you can get out of them. However, the price will typically be based on you know, the delta of the trade to the NAV, but they're tradable, right? So if you want to get to a mutual, out of a mutual fund, you have to give notice and it'll be at a post four o'clock price today and you'll get the money in two or three days. ETFs are essentially tradable mutual funds. Um, and, you know, um, if you think that you want liquidity, then ETFs are great and they are low cost. If you have the discipline to simply buy funds that don't have loads and don't have extra sales fees, which you can do freely now on almost, you know, Vanguard, Fidelity, any of these platforms, um, they're, you know, do they provide that much? advantage, maybe not. They're super helpful to private funds because they tend to short them as against their long portfolios and that kind of stuff. But I think for retail investors, as long as you're disciplined, don't, don't buy load mutual funds. They're just a vanishing breed, but don't buy them. So, and then you can, they're pretty, if you do that, they're pretty much interchangeable. And if you don't need instant liquidity, Um, so thoughts about, you know, kind of broke, so brokers versus like online apps and that kind of stuff. Um, I, you know, I, I think the biggest single thing on all investing, right, is cost. So um, you, you want to look at what are you getting from a broker, which is what Edward Jones is, versus what you could get by simply going online and opening a Fidelity or Vanguard or somebody account, right? So um, just make sure that you're cognizant of all the fees. It's not always that clear. Um, one other piece, almost invisible to the American public, unfortunately, but very relevant in our business and in the government, was you have two types of firms involved in this. There are investment advisors who are registered with the SEC who have a fiduciary obligation to you, the customer, to put your best interest for first. Brokers in America, not subject to that fiduciary standard, but now subject to something called reg best interest, which tries to impose that duty on them when they deal with retail. Um, investment advisors are usually the better deal. American public completely confused because unfortunately the SEC allowed brokers to call themselves financial advisors. So wait, I've got a broker called a financial advisor. How do I know if they're an investment advisor? I mean, it's ridiculous, right, that we had the two regimes and that, we, that the SEC allowed that. Um, so I would look for registered investment advisors, but no matter who you're talking to, cost. So I was talking to someone last night after the Harvard Club talk and you know, basically had a friend and a advisor was, was proposing an absorbent rate to manage their money. And I mean, that's just terrible. So be careful for those costs. All right, I think we're right on one. I realize it's tight timing, law school classes and everything. So thanks so much. <clears throat>